Welcome back, WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. Nothing more positive than when we get together and get our representatives uh, on the air to tell some stories. And, uh, and certainly, uh, uh, this guy, no stranger to us around here, my neighbor here in Baltimore for going on two decades, and now our U.S. Congressman representing the 7th District of Maryland, Don Moeller. Uh, always good to have Hwaisim Fume back on the program. What's going on? How are you today? I'm doing great. It's always good to be here with both of you, and uh, it seems like it's been a long time since our last visit, so we'll have to make oh, it a goodness. shorter time the next time. Huh? I think we bumped into you at State Fair, didn't we, just sort of inadvertently? That's right. Well, it's Right, right we, before the election. We haven't been able to bump into anybody. Let me, uh, <laughs> let, let me just jump right in and, and say that I had an amazing moment yesterday. My, my eighth grade, going into eighth grade grandson, stopped by the house. Uh, during the service for Congressman Lewis, and he sat and he just had questions and he he wanted to know, you know, why it was such a big deal and why were so many people doing this? And there were moments, there were moments, and I'm watching on TV where I mean I'm a weepy guy anyway, where I was just I just felt the emotion well up. You were there, and I'm just going to start by saying to you, walk our listeners through what it was like to be at that service yesterday? Well, Don, it, it was moving. It was emotional. It was uh, a dozen flashbacks to an era long since gone, but an era that we still remember. It was historic in the sense that John Lewis was one of the uh, great freedom fighters from that portion of American history where there was a struggle uh, to secure voting rights, to secure uh, basic protections under the law. And so when you sit there and you look at John's coffin, uh, resting on the same stand that the coffin of Abraham Lincoln rested on, it just calls you back to why we are here as Americans doing what we think we can do to make every generation better. I mean, the generation before John, uh, which is made up of my ancestors and yours did what they could do. John and his generation, which is a part of the generation that we're in, are doing what we're doing. Uh, but it's important to tell the story because the generations behind us, like your grandson, don't know what that story is unless we become the griots and the storytellers so that they understand, make the connection, and are able to do the same thing in their time. We well, you know, I see civil rights leader and then politician. That that wasn't really possible when he when he was the, to be a civil rights leader. Probably meant that, that that you could aspire to be a politician at that point, fifty years ago in this country. Well, yeah, John was born in an era of Jim Crow and vile segregation, where he had to defy the limitedness of others' expectations of him. He knew that politics changes people, so he set out quickly to change politics, and did he ever do that? And so while his victories and accomplishments and honors are far too numerous to mention, I think it's important for people to know that John just wanted to be remembered as a simple man with a fire in his belly for justice, uh, someone who didn't take himself too seriously, and someone who was always willing to go the extra mile for what he believed in. Talk about, Congressman, the efforts underway to rename it. And again, we have to recognize that a lot of our listeners are younger and may not even be familiar with the history of the Edmund Pettus Bridge. I actually remember as a first year, how long ago it was, Nestor, as a first year social studies teacher teaching a lesson on Bloody Sunday and the incident at the Edmund Pettus Bridge, which as a first year social studies teacher, I'm only roughly a decade or so removed from that at that time. Um, the question is, where are you in terms of renaming the bridge and refresh for our listeners the significance of that bridge and Bloody Sunday? Well, Bloody Sunday uh, marked the point in the civil rights movement uh, because of television that people could actually see the viciousness of the attacks that were being waged against persons who were nonviolently protesting. That was a seminal moment, as was the role of television in the Vietnam War, when people were actually able to see our troops being killed and being attended to on the battlefield and being brought back home in body bags. It underscored the seriousness of the war, 
just like this incident on that bridge underscored the seriousness of that movement when you saw people being hit with billy clubs and bitten by dogs and having water poured, poured on them. It, it just grabbed the American consciousness. And so people who had been dispassionate or somewhat removed could no longer remove themselves. And so it did become the seminal moment because it was that one incident that, that, one incident that drove Lyndon Bain Johnson and the Congress to act on the Voting Rights Act, something that John and Dr. Martin Luther King had strongly pushed for. And it's also where people from all over the country who had no idea of the viciousness of what was happening had an opportunity to see that for themselves. And I think it changed the tone and the tenor of the civil rights movement forever, just like those incidents regarding the Vietnam War changed the tone and tenor of Americans who realized, in that case, we needed to get out of Vietnam. And in this case, we needed to get into the civil rights movement. And that's why it's so important. And that's why people think about that moment, that one moment in time. Should that bridge now be called the John Lewis Bridge? Well, I think it should, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's up to the people of Selma. Um, there were a lot of people on that bridge that day, and John would probably say, no, don't name it after me. And I, I knew him that well, because he knew there were so many other people, nameless and faceless, on that bridge that got bitten by a dog or had their head busted open like he did. But it's really up to the uh, the citizens of Selma, and if they want it, I think you're going to see um, a real swift effort to get that done. Um, but I think John would probably want the Voting Rights Act, which has currently been sitting in the Senate for almost 100 days now, to be passed. Uh, that's what he fought for and believed in. And so there, that has been renamed, by the way, as the John Lewis uh, Justice and Voting Act, whether or not Mitch McConnell and the others move on it is another uh, uh, matter altogether. But uh, he, if he were here, would probably want that more so than a bridge. You both kind of now, arrived in D.C. at the same time, right, in 87? Yeah, we, John and I had a lot of little similarities by the time we got to the Congress. In 1986, he ran for the Congress in Atlanta. I ran for the Congress here in Baltimore. He was running against an icon, Julian Bond, uh, who was simply revered in the South and in Atlanta then. Uh, he was kind of bigger than life. And I was running against an icon named Clarence Mitchell, Jr., who had great stature here in the uh, Maryland area. Julian was a state senator. Clarence was a state senator. This was John's first run. It was my first run. And we were both considered, I don't even want to use the term underdogs. People just said we didn't have a chance of winning. So the fact that we both won that year, uh, in November, and that we, uh, in January of 87, stood together uh, to take the oath of office as classmates in what was known as the historic 100th Congress was significant. Um, John, myself, a young lawyer out of Mississippi named Mike Espy, a young preacher out of New York by the name of Floyd Flake, were the only four African Americans elected to Congress that year in that election. And so John grabbed us all on the floor we held each other like we were in a huddle following his instructions. And he said, look, we all got here in a different way, but we're all a band of brothers now. And this, from this point on, that's what we shall be, and that's what we were. So, uh, you know, long story short, I ended up leaving the Congress 10 years afterwards to go try and save the NAACP. Uh, Floyd ended up leaving to go back to be a full-time preacher shortly thereafter. Uh, and Mike Espy left to become the Secretary of Agriculture. But our band and our bond remained. Well, you know, C Congressman, when you talk, I, I get chills about this journey. And one of the things that's given me chills over the past month or so is the fact that on the same day that Congressman Lewis died, another icon of the civil rights movement that many people may not be familiar with uh, a minister by the name of C.T. Vivian passed the same day. It almost reminded me of when Jefferson and Adams died 50 years to the day after the revolution within hours of one another. These two giants of the civil rights movement passed on the same day. C can you tell us a little bit about C.T. Vivian and why he should be part of our history books as well? Well, C.T. Vivian was Dr. King's right hand, um, and everybody who were part and parcel of the movement at that time knew that. 
Uh, yes, Ralph Abernathy and he were friends, and many of the others, uh, whether it was uh, um, Andrew Young or someone else, but it was C.T. Vivian more so than anybody that he relied on. And for years, C.T. Vivian stayed in the background following uh, Dr. King's death. And as he got older, I think he was 90 when he passed, uh, you heard less and less of him. But everybody who was a part of that era revered him and understood that much of the greatness in Martin Luther King came about as a result of having the wise counsel of C.T. Vivian. So it was almost providential that they would die on the same day. And by the way, in the same town, um, that was just something that caught me and struck me as rather, not odd, but providential, as I said, as if it were supposed to have happened that way. Can't have you on without talking about COVID and what's been a crazy year for everyone, but certainly you deciding to uh, to dive back into politics, win an election, run, run again amidst all of this and the voting madness of all of this. When I when I think about John Lewis, I think about Georgia, and uh, I see what's going on down there with voter suppression and where we are in this country with a, a, a sitting president that would not attend John Lewis's funeral. Um, I, you know, I, we're in some strange times here, and certainly since the last time we saw each other at State Fair, I think I was having the chicken and waffles or the shrimp and grits or something tasty. <laughs> but the world's changed a lot since you and I run into each other in the building we've lived in the last two decades. Yeah, yeah, it has changed a lot. And uh, electorally, for me, you're right, it has been an odd year. I've had three elections already in uh, uh, 2020, February, April, and June. And we still have another election in November. So uh, this represents one of those rare cases where if you're a political science student, it's a great case study for your students because (laughs) who else has to have four elections in one year? Um, But that's what came about as a result of Elijah Cummings' uh, passing and the special election and the special primary and then the general and now the upcoming general because we're in a presidential election year. Uh, But, you know, I'll take what's what's given me. I I I had an opportunity to meet a lot of uh, new people who I haven't known during this campaign, make a lot of new friends, hear a lot of stories about people in their communities, whether it's Howard County or Baltimore County or even the city, uh, things that people want you to know about their neighborhoods and and want you to be about as their representative. So it's been a great learning experience, but you're right, it has been cut short by COVID. I mean, things started shutting down on March 5th uh, in the state and then March 15th nationwide as a result of executive orders from the governor and the president, and it's been difficult. It was difficult to campaign, but more importantly, it's just difficult to interact and to meet people and to share ideas and to listen to concerns. So I'm doing it the same way everybody else is doing it by way of teleconferencing and Zoom and all the other platforms out there. But it has been an interesting year. This virus is a tricky virus. It's already taken over about 140,000 American lives, and there is no real end to it. I, I have to confess that I'm still scratching my head about why there was a real need to start a baseball season uh, and to return back to an NBA season when we just don't know what the perils are going to be. And as we all know now, the baseball season is threatened because uh, this thing has shown up uh, on team members and in areas and in states where the incidence is very high. So I think we've got to focus on what we know we can do. We know we can wear masks. We know we can find a way to get tested. We know now that some tracing is taking place, so we're able to figure out who may have infected whom, and we have to continue to push for a vaccine and not do the things that uh, run the rate back up, because this is the second wave that we're into, and it was almost predictable. I know your time is short, and you're busy out uh, running uh, the seventh. You're my representative. Don, uh, I know you had some, one final shot for... for uh, Just one, one quick question before we let the congressman run. Uh, give us your reaction to what's happening in Portland, Congressman, because we watch on TV, and it's just hard to comprehend what's happening in the United States of America. Give us your reaction. Well, I think there's several things that are probably happening in Portland, the most important of which is that there are a number of people who wanted to peacefully demonstrate and petition the government for the redress of their grievances, something that is enshrined and guaranteed by the Constitution. And those people have done that and will continue to do it. There are some other people who have different uh, agendas, who have mixed in, slipped in, and sort of uh, not taken over, but have driven aspects of 
the demonstration, which have then required responses by police officers, and there's a lot of press coverage. And the press coverage tends to focus more on those instances of clashes as opposed to what really brought this about and what the people who really were doing nonviolently and are still doing. Uh, they don't seem to get that kind of coverage. I think that the president, uh, Donald Trump, has kind of inflamed the situation by making it an us versus them, police versus them kind of uh, standoff when it's much more complicated than that. I think the uh, mayor there probably has not done all uh, that was possible on the ground in Seattle to try to ameliorate what was going on and to manage the protests and now manage the crises. And I think also that uh, what you see there is being replicated in other places, maybe not to the same extent, because people really want to believe that their government is listening. And in my opinion, at least, if the government is listening, you've got to say that. You've got to say, we hear you. We agree or we don't agree, but you have a right to protest. We don't want you to destroy public property and federal property. We don't want you to deface buildings and to set fires or to, to loot, but you have a right to p protest. And as long as you're going to do that, we will protect you and we will protect that right. But it's turned around to an us versus them situation. And as a result of that, unfortunately, uh, it continues to make the news every night, and it's being reported in a way that takes away from the real effort to bring about attention to police brutality through uh, the attention that's required in terms of violence, because they show violence. And then you get a lot of places like some of the commentary on Fox TV that incites the situation by making suggestions and reporting it with commentary in a way that's not factual. So I don't know if I know what's going on any more than you. I know what I see, and what I see disturbs me because uh, what this started out to be and the way it's being reported now are two different things. We appreciate your time, Congressman. Uh, I know you got a lot on your plate here in the middle of COVID and uh, elections and the country and all that. Uh, we, we hope to run into you again soon and uh, from six feet away and have a sandwich or something like we do as citizens. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh -huh. Congressman Kwasi Fume representing us here from the 7th on behalf of former Baltimore County Executive Don Moeller. I am Nestor Aparicio. We're together with almost 260 now conversations available for you at Baltimore Positive and at WNST.net, AM 1570, Towson, Baltimore. We are calm, we are local, and we are Baltimore Positive.